I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. This is a tale about justice. About the lady who stands over the criminal courthouses of America with a blindfold over her eyes. Of course, the blindfold represents impartiality, not faulty vision. But yet, there are occasions when justice seems to be looking the other way. And that's something which bothers attorney Ned Murray very much indeed. He's getting away with murder, Tony. And maybe he'll get away with another one. Maybe there's an answer. What? I've been waiting a long time to figure out what I could do for you, Ned. What kind of favor might be important to you? Now I know. Tony! You're thinking about killing Rydell. mystery drama, After the Verdict, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Tony Roberts. It is sponsored in part by new sugar-free diet 7-Up and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. better place to begin a story about justice than in a courtroom. This one is packed today because it's the day the jury is going to return its verdict in the case of the People versus Louis Rydell. That's Rydell over there. The thin man with the burning eyes. See the way he searches the face of every juror who takes his or her place in the jury box? It's only natural, of course. Because Louis Rydell had been charged with murder. Shh, shh, quiet now. Presiding Judge Lincoln Arthur is about to speak. The foreman of the jury will please rise. Has the jury reached a verdict in this case? We, uh, we have, Your Honor. Please read your verdict to the court. We find the defendant, Louis Rydell... Not guilty. Congratulations, Lou. I'm very happy. You're happy. How do you think I feel? Hey, come on. Let's get out of this place. Let's celebrate, huh? Let's pick up my wife and have a ball. Well, I, I don't think I can. I promised my boss that I'd go down. You don't care about your boss. You want to see that daughter of his. Okay, we'll make it a foursome. I can't, Lou. I'm sorry. Oh, come on. Come on, counselor. No, and he's got a cab waiting outside. Did I read those faces wrong? I thought, that's a hanging jury if ever I saw one. The only one I was worried about was that little old lady with the blue hair. <laughs> you just can't tell about a jury from their faces. My last case, well, uh, I thought they all looked friendly, but uh, well, I lost. <laughs> you won this one, Mr. Murray. I bet that boss of yours is real pleased. I mean, all this publicity that you got. Well, you're a regular Clarence Darrow. <laughs> Look, Lou, we don't really have to talk about the fee settlement now. Why don't you and Melanie just go out and drink up a couple of bottles of champagne? Oh, Lou doesn't drink, Mr. Murray. Lou doesn't have any vices. Do you, Lou? I want to get the money settled, Counselor. Melanie here doesn't like to hear about money. She just likes to spend it. We'll drop her off at home. Hey, you promised to take me someplace. Wait for me at home, Pumpkin. Oh. Daddy will be there just as soon as he settles things with his lawyer. Okay? What choice do I have? I'll be home in an hour or two, and we'll go out to dinner. Just stay in the apartment, and don't open the door to anyone. And if you have to open the door, wear some clothes, baby. Huh? Yeah, this is a nice little office you got here, Mr. Murray. Only, uh... Strikes me as kind of small, isn't it? Well, it's big enough, Lou. I mean, compared to that big office down the hall, Mr. Ostrow. Uh, Mr. Ostrow is the senior partner of this firm, Lou. <laughs> well, maybe when you marry his daughter. You are going to marry that chick, aren't you? Let's get down to business, okay? I mean, the way she was hanging around that courtroom every day of the trial, I figured 
She was pretty stuck on you. Lou, this meeting was your idea. <clears throat> you said you could manage to pay about 150 a month, and that's perfectly fine with me. Sure, Mr. Murray, anything you say. We could have settled this in the taxi. I guess they just didn't want to face Melanie for a couple of hours. They needed an excuse. You understand? I suppose so. She's beautiful, isn't she? Mrs. Rydell? No, oh, yes, she's very lovely. She can't help herself, you know. The way men bother her all the time. They look at her and right away they get ideas. It's not her fault. No. She's not smart about it, though. She doesn't know the way men think. Like the way she answers the door sometimes in that sloppy house coat. She gives people ideas. Like that kid Yost. I feel sorry for that kid, you know? I know you do. It's just too bad that he got himself mugged the day after you threw him out of the house. You wouldn't have gone through all this. You wouldn't be owing me 150 bucks a month. Yeah, I feel sorry for him. Kid delivers the groceries every day. Gets the same eyeful every day. His tongue must have been hanging out. Lou, I really have to get on home. I've got a party at my boss's house tonight. But just the same, I'd do it again. That's the way I am. The guy touches my wife. I get a red fire in my brain, and I can't stop myself. Now, I, I, I owe you a lot, Mr. Murray. More than money. Well, forget it. Just learn to keep your temper. I really killed that boy, you know? What? What did you say? I killed him, Mr. Murray. I waited for him in the hallway the next day, and I grabbed him. He was a scrawny kid. It was like ringing in the neck of a chicken. I do the same thing again, Mr. Murray. To the next guy who bothers my wife. They've got to learn. Well, better go now. Melanie's waiting for me. You lied to me. Every stinking word you told me was a lie. Don't be sore, Mr. Murray. I couldn't tell you the truth, could I? I mean, you wouldn't have taken the case, would you? Yes. I would have taken the case and told you to plead guilty with cause. No, that wouldn't have been any good. I wanted you to get me off. And that's what you did. Look, Look I've got to go now, Mr. Murray. I just want to say thanks again. Oh, you think it's that simple? You think you can just walk out of here? Well, Melanie's waiting for me. She likes to eat dinner early. The girl's always hungry. So long, Mr. Murray. Oh, my God. Where you been? Sorry I'm so late, Mr. Ostrom. Who do you think this party's for, anyway? Well, come in, come in, come in. Karen's going out of her brain waiting for you to get here. This one looks like quite a crowd. <laughs> They're all in your pocket tonight now, Ned. All right, everybody, hold it, hold it. Here's the man we've all been waiting for. Ned Murray, folks. Greatest trial lawyer since Clarence... Eh, uh, no. Since Harry Ostrom. <laughs> All right, come on, Ned. Karen's over here. Ned. Hi, darling. Where in the world have you been? The party started two hours ago. I just lost track of the time, that's all. Ah, uh, must be love if you ask me. All right, I'll see you kids later. Ned, come into the kitchen for a minute. No, it's full of servants. Come into the bedroom. Now, that's an offer I can't refuse. <laughs> well, what did you have in mind? Give you one guess. Oh, darling, I'm so proud of you. You were so wonderful. That kiss was pretty wonderful. <sighs> Father says that you were everything he used to be in the courtroom. And there's no higher praise he can give than that. <laughs> uh, look, let's forget about the trial. It's over. Oh, no, I don't want to forget about it, Ned. I'm just so thrilled with the way you handled the case... That man Rydell seems so guilty. But there's too much fuss about all this, Karen. Father said that if you could win this case, you could do anything. That it would mean a lot of business to the firm. Do you know what I think? He's not going to wait on that promise about the junior partnership. I think he's going to do something about it right now. Are you serious? Don't tell him what I said, but I'm sure of it. Ned, you'll have to stop making excuses pretty soon, lover. You'll have to name the day. Oh, for heaven's sake. It's probably your father wanting me to join the party. Hi, 
Hiya, Ned. Ostrow told me you were here. Tony, for the love of Mike, <laughs> I haven't seen you in ages. Yeah, that's right. Oh, hey, I am sorry. I didn't know you had somebody with you. It's all right, Mr. Igo. I was just going to fix my makeup. See you later, darling. Yes, yes, sure. <clears throat> Tony, I don't think I ever saw you at Ostrow's before. Yeah, you know me, Ned. I don't like to mix with all these big shots. Hey, you still talk to ordinary people, big celebrity like you, huh? Yeah, I'll talk to you anytime, Tony. <laughs> Listen, I was in court today. I've been there the last four days. Bet you didn't even notice, huh? Well, <laughs> that was nice of you, busy man like you. Well, I got a personal interest. You know that. Sure. Tony... I was real glad you won, kid. Reminded me all over again what you did for me two years ago. Get me off that murder rap. It was like... Seeing the whole thing again. It wasn't the same, Tony. For one thing, you didn't kill it. I mean, uh, come on, let's go out and get a drink. Huh? Nah, not for me. Since I seen you last, I got me an ulcer. That's the price of success, you know, in my business, just like yours. That's too bad. You know something, Ned? You don't look so healthy yourself. Nah, I'm okay. You look great in that courtroom, only now... Yeah, you don't look like a guy who won a case. You look like a loser. I'm just tired. Uh, let down, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, look, Ned. Uh, you remember what I told you once, huh? You got any troubles you can't handle, I want to hear about them. You got a favor coming from me. And it bothers me not to pay off. That was a long time ago. You don't owe me anything. I keep good books. Don't tell me who I owe. Hey, go on, Ned. Find that girl of yours. Maybe she can cheer you up, huh? Tell you the truth, Tony, I need a couple of minutes all by myself. You know how it is. Huh? Yeah, sure, I know how it is. Sometimes too much is too much. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> See you around later, kid. Okay? Yeah, yeah, later. Sometimes too much is too much. They really killed that boy, you know. He killed him. He killed him, and I let him get away with it. I killed him, Mr. Murray. Oh, God. I'll do the same thing again to the next guy who bothers my wife. I'll do the same thing, Mr. Murray. The same thing. <laughs> Mr. Murray. Hello, Mrs. Rydell. Oh, well, Lou isn't home, you know. Oh, he, he went to see Mr. Fleming about going back to the company. I knew he wasn't home. May I come in anyway? Oh, yeah, sure. Look, do you think Lou will have any trouble? I mean, getting his old job back? You know, he was their best salesman before... before the trouble happened. They won't hold it against him, will they? I don't know. I want to ask you a few things. Yeah? Oh, well, Sure. Mrs. Rydell, before the trial, you told me your husband was the jealous type. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But you said there was never any reason for his jealousy. But do we have to go through that again? The trial's over, isn't it? Please, it's more important than you think. Why? This delivery boy, uh, Yost. I tried to underplay Lou's anger about him in court, but... Uh, he was really pretty sore about the pass he made at you, wasn't he? But I told you all that. Yes, Lou was sore. Sore. He was crazy. I didn't even want to tell him about the kid because I was afraid he'd... Well, you know... Mrs. Rydell, the trial is over, just as you said. Nobody can charge Lou with the same crime again. That's the law in this state. So you've got nothing to lose by telling me the absolute truth. About what? Lou did kill that boy, didn't he? Hey! He waited for him the next day and choked him to death. That's a dirty lie. How could you of all people... All right, all right. Maybe you didn't know the truth. Maybe you believed your husband the way I did. You get out of here, mister. Please, I'm not through. The reason I know this is because Lou told me himself yesterday in my office. Lou isn't going to change because of the trial. He's an insanely jealous man, and he might very well do the same thing again. Oh. You're awful. 
I thought you were so nice, Mr. Murray, but you're terrible. I had to let you know how things are with Lou. He got away with murder, and that makes me sick to my stomach. There's not much I can do about it, but maybe you can do something, Mrs. Rydell. Me? You can be careful. Do you understand? No. You've got to make sure he never has any reason to be jealous. Listen, if you think I play around... Even if he misunderstands your behavior, somebody else might get Lou's hands around his throat. It might even be easier for him the next time. He got away with it once. Please, Mrs. Rydell, for his sake. All right, for mine. Don't make your husband kill again. I don't know about you, but I think Mr. Murray's request is very reasonable. The only problem, of course, is exactly how reasonable Lou Rydell is. There's something about the man's eyes, the way his hands twitch personally. I don't think it would be a very good idea to wink at Mrs. Rydell. I'll return shortly with Act Two. And now here's Act Two of After the Verdict. It's a bright, sunny morning. The kind of morning that fills promising young men like Ned Murray with enthusiasm for life. After all, he has everything going for him. A fine career ahead, marriage to a lovely young lady who also happens to be the boss's daughter. And even if his recent triumph has turned a bit sour, it was still a triumph, wasn't it? But as Ned Murray goes to see Harry Ostrow, he finds the sun isn't shining in the big corner office. The shades are drawn. His boss's face is a thundercloud. You wanted to see me, Mr. Ostro? Yes. Come in and shut the door. Hello, Mr. Murray. Nice to see you again. Hello, Lou. Uh, What are you doing here? Mr. Rydell's told me something I find hard to believe, Ned. I said he must be mistaken, but he swears it's true. Did you go to see Mrs. Rydell yesterday? Yes. Why did you think it was necessary to do that? Uh, I had something I wanted to tell her. It was strictly an unofficial visit. You told her I was guilty. You went up there deliberately just to frighten her. I ought to sue you for what you did, Mr. Murray. Lawyer or no lawyer. What kind of nonsense is this, Ned? You didn't say any such thing, did you? Well, did you... Yes, sir, I did. What? I I didn't go there to frighten her, just to warn her. Right after the trial, Mr. Rydell here obliged me with a nice little confession. A little late, I'm afraid. Confession? What are you talking about? That's a lie. I don't know what you've got against me, Mr. Murray, but I never heard of a lawyer behaving like this. I didn't kill that boy. The jury said so. And that... Please, this is all so ridiculous. Mr. Rydell put it very bluntly. He said he killed Yost. He said he'd kill again if another Yost came along. You can't do that. It's over. The trial's over. They can't put me through this again. They can't. No, no, Mr. Rydell. Of course they can't. There's nothing to get excited about. Mr. Murray just misunderstood you, that's all. I read him loud and clear. I knew I couldn't get him back in a courtroom because of double jeopardy, but I thought if I went to the D.A., he'd be a lot more careful with his hands the next time. I'll sue you. I'll sue this whole firm for slander. You hear that, Ostra? Now, please, Ned. Apologize to Mr. Rydell. Tell him you didn't mean it. Apologize? Yes, I should apologize to the state for saving his skin. Ned. Ned, you listen to me now. I don't know what went on between you and this man, and I don't care. But he's a client, understand? My client, even if you handle the case. And there's such a thing as lawyer-client privilege. Since when does it include murder? Shut up and listen to me. Anything you do reflects on me, on the way I run this firm. Mr. Rydell got a fair trial under law. Better than fair. Yes. And the jury acquitted him. That's all we have to know. You don't have any right to violate any confidences he made to you. Didn't they teach you that in law school? They taught me something else. They taught me the lawyer's main concern was for justice. You talk about justice, huh? 
Go talk to that hoodlum buddy of yours, Tony Igo. If there was justice, you think that crook would be walking around loose? Tony was innocent of that murder charge. Because the jury said so. And they said the same thing about Mr. Rydell here. And that's that, my boy. Understand? Uh, Who is it? Oh, for Pete's sake. Can't they let a guy get some rest in his own home? Well, have I caught you with a blonde? You caught me with a bottle. And just in time, obviously. Well, the least I can do is make sure you don't drink alone. Not enough for the two of us. Even if I give you this? What is it? A present. Open it. It's that pipe you were so crazy about. The one with the ivory carving. I was saving it for some special occasion. But your birthday isn't for six months. It's a beauty. If you're going to bribe me, I prefer cash. Really? And I thought I'd use sex appeal. I understand that sure fire. Excuse me, it's time for another drink. <laughs> What's so funny? The whole thing. You, father. He told me about that scene in his office this morning. I wish I could have been there. Clarence Darrow versus William Jennings Bryan. It wasn't. It was stupid versus childish, and all because of that... All because of that silly man with the funny eyes. Honestly, Ned, I hope you won't make any more fuss about him. I thought it was Daddy who was making the fuss. Believe me, I I think he feels just awful about the whole silly quarrel. Yeah, I'll bet he does. Oh, for heaven's sake, Ned, why would you want to spoil things now? All right, maybe that idiotic man did kill that grocery boy, but I'm not saying he didn't, but... Well, wouldn't it... Wouldn't be the first time that a guilty man is... Dead! It's the first time for me. Don't you understand that? The first time I ever got a guilty man off? Was it really, darling? Well, that man I go... Tony was innocent! Well, innocent of that crime, maybe, but what about all the others? He might have killed a dozen men before, or had them killed. He wasn't being tried for killing a dozen men, only one. And he was innocent of that. I should know better than to talk to you while you're drinking. I'm going to the district attorney tomorrow, Karen. Even if it doesn't do a bit of good, I'll feel better for it. Do you know what the DA will say? He'll say you're a fool. I don't care. You haven't got a shred of proof. Not a shred. And all the proof in the world wouldn't put Lou Rydell back on the stand. You know that, don't you? If you go to the D.A. tomorrow, you... You can find yourself another connection. What? What was that? Oh, I'm sorry, Ned, but... He did say it. And I know my father. I know he never says anything he doesn't mean. What about you, Karen? What about the connection between me and you? I waited long enough for you to get serious about me, Ned. I can wait a little longer until you come to your senses. And that's the real bribe, isn't it? Take it easy, will you? Give a guy a chance. Tony, what the heck are you doing here? Boy, you've really been working at it, kid. Huh? I'm an invited guest, remember? (laughs) No, I guess you don't. About an hour ago, you called me up, told me to come have a drink with you. Well, here I am. Want to change your mind? No, no, no. Come on in. I told you, make mine ginger ale or something. I'll drink with you. <laughs> no, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, Tony. That's that's about all I've got left. Just one more drink. Hey, 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 hey. What is this, kid? This celebration going on a long time, ain't it? I'm not celebrating now, Tony. Commiserating. That's the word, isn't it? It doesn't sound right. Commiserating. Don't ask me. I never heard it before. Uh, it means I'm feeling sorry for somebody. For who? For a dumb kid, name of Yost. 
Dumb kid from the grocery. You mean a kid that got killed? Yeah, that's right, that got killed. Yeah. And you know who killed him? How should I know? Where's that drink? Oh, there it is. Here's the crime, Tony. Put it down, Ned. What? You heard me. Put it down. You want to tell me your troubles? Okay, I'll put on a pot of coffee for both of us. Huh. Does that make you feel any better? No. Well, give it time. <laughs> Tony, were you listening to me? Did you hear what I told you? Yeah, I heard you. This guy, Rydell, is a kookaboo. He's getting away with murder, Tony. And maybe he'll get away with another one. Nah, next time will be different. You'll know different from one thing. Meantime, somebody gets killed. Well, what's that to you? <laughs> I'm sorry. Sir, I, I forgot the kind of guy I'm talking to. What am I going to feel like when it happens, Tony? Well, there must be some way to nail this crumb. No. No, there isn't. The law protects him. Uh, Double jeopardy. A man can't be tried twice for the same crime. That's how it goes, Tony. One trial to a customer. Uh, it's a shame, all right. They hung better guys than that, and he's walking around free as air. That's the law, Tony. Yeah, yeah, the law. Okay, if it bothers you so much, stop him. Yeah. Tell me how. Everybody else has to pay the penalty, right? Why not him? It's too late. It's too late, Tony. What a law, maybe. Huh? Want some more coffee? No. I think I'll get myself a cup. Yeah, maybe there's an answer. What? I've been waiting a long time to figure out what I could do for you, Ned. What kind of favor might be important to you. Now I know. How do you mean, favor? Well, it won't be just for you. I'd be doing everybody a favor, the whole state, right? Only when it happens, I mean it for you, Ned. Remember that. See? It's good coffee. <laughs> well, see you around. Tony, uh, wait. Wait wait a minute. Oh, it's getting late, kid. I have to go. What? What was that you just said? What's... What's in your mind? Uh, nothing, nothing. Come on, I did my good deed for day. <laughs> Let me out of here now, huh? I, I want to know what you meant by uh, a favor. You know what the word means. You're thinking of killing Rydell. Oh, you see too many movies. Tony, kid. don't be crazy. I don't want that kind of favor, understand? Yeah, 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 sure. Just let him loose, huh? So what if he gets away with murder, huh? Killing him is no answer. Sure, so let some other slobs get knocked off, huh? That's better. I didn't mean all those things I said, Tony. You got the wrong idea. This guy didn't kill a grocery boy. He's killing you too, buddy, and that's what I care about. But you got nothing to be afraid of. Nothing's gonna rub off on you. I know my business. Just like you know yours. So long, kid. Tony! Usually, it's a very good thing to have friends. Loyal friends who are always willing to do you a favor. But it looks as if Tony Igo is going to do a good deed by committing a very bad deed. The question is, can one murder avenge another? We'll find out shortly when we return with Act Three. last act of After the Verdict. Listen closely. Here's a sound we don't hear very often. Yes. What with all these electric clocks and digital clocks and electronic clocks, the good old-fashioned ticking that marks off the minutes and hours of the night is rarely heard. But tonight, Ned Murray is hearing that sound. Hearing it from a clock which normally purrs softly on his night table. But Ned's hearing is highly sensitive tonight. His brain is tuned like a high-frequency instrument, picking out the slightest vibrations, tuning in on voices he doesn't want to hear. It 
won't be just for you, Ned. I'd be doing everybody a favor, the whole state, right? Yes. That's true enough. They hung better guys than that, and he's walking around three years ahead. Yes. Everybody has to pay the penalty, right? Why not him? Yes. It's true. Why shouldn't he pay? A man is murdered. A murderer has to pay. Tony is right. He's right. Hello? How are you, darling? Uh, I'm all right. I, I'm, I'm in bed. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I wake you up? No, uh, no, I was just lying here. You're not sick, are you? No. Well, it's only 10.30. I didn't think you went to bed so early. Uh, I did tonight. You're angry with me, aren't you? No, Karen, I'm just tired. I, I drank too much. Oh, I knew you'd do that. Ned, I... I'm so mixed up. Well, what's there to be mixed up about? I... The choices are pretty clear, aren't they? Are they? Not to me, they aren't. I don't think things are ever that simple. Especially when it comes to law. Just ask your father. He knows all about the law. He knows how to make money at it. That proves it. That isn't fair, Ned. No. No, no, no. I suppose it isn't. Don't you remember what he used to say? That if the time ever comes when right and wrong are absolutely clear, there won't be any need for lawyers. Your father didn't say that, Karen. He was quoting someone. Who? Judge Lincoln Arthur, as a matter of fact, the judge at Rydell's trial. Well, it makes very good sense to me. Yeah. Judge Arthur always made sense to me, too. Karen, do you mind if I hang up now? Then you are. No, 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 no. It's just that I, I have to make a call. A very important call. All right, Ned, but will you call me tomorrow? Yes. If there is one. Good night, Karen. Information? G uh, can you give me the number of uh, uh, Judge Lincoln Arthur? Sure you don't want any wine, Ned? No, no Judge, thanks. I, I've sworn off that stuff for the duration of my life. <laughs> Sounds like you had yourself a party. Is that when you came up with this parable? You know what you call it? <laughs> no, Judge. Uh, it's, it's more like a, a riddle. A, a legal riddle. The only thing is, I already know the answer. Oh, all right. Let's see if I know it. It's about a lawyer. A criminal lawyer who defends somebody for murder and does it successfully. He's convinced of his client's innocence, understand? And that helps him get the acquittal. But right after the verdict, he makes a discovery that his client is guilty. How does he make this discovery? Is that important? Well, it might be. Was it on evidence that had appeared at the trial? Evidence he had misinterpreted or concealed unknowingly? No. It was a confession. Uh, how does he obtain this confession? It's given to him, unsolicited by his clients. Why? I don't know. Perversity, pride, ego. Anyway, he knows the truth about his client. And he knows something worse that the man is more than capable of committing a similar crime. In fact, he boasts of the possibility almost gleefully. Any witnesses to this confession? No. And when he's confronted with it, the client denies ever having made it. Mm -hmm. You're not asking a legal question, Ned. I'm sure you know where your hypothetical lawyer stands legally. In the middle of nowhere. Is this a moral question, maybe? Well, you might say that. I mean, if you were that lawyer, Judge, what would you do? If I were that lawyer, Ned, and if I were your age, I suppose I'd do what you're doing now. 
I'd get angry with my client, with myself, maybe even with the law. But if I were practicing now, I think I'd feel different. How different? I wouldn't feel anger, only pity. Pity? For a man like that? Yes, exactly for that kind of man. A man who feels a compulsion to confess must have felt a similar compulsion to kill. Their symptoms are the same disease, Ned. And if there's one thing the law has learned in this century, it's the ability to feel compassion for the emotionally disturbed. Yeah, he's that all right, but that doesn't... Uh... Ned, this parable of yours, uh, you talking about Louis Rydell? Yes. He told you that he murdered Yost? He did, I swear it. In my office, the same day of the verdict. Oh, for God's sake, Ned, use your brains. Can't you see that the man's mentally ill? Everything points to it. He killed a boy just for putting an arm around his wife. He confesses when there's no need to confess. Is it worthwhile venting all this anger against such a man? But he's dangerous. He, he'll do this again, Judge, if a man just looks cross-eyed at his wife. It'll be another excuse for murder. If he had confessed this to you before the trial was over... I would have demanded that he plead guilty. He'd be waiting to serve a life sentence right now. And, Ned, you're forgetting something. What? I was the judge at the trial. It was my prerogative to pass sentence, not yours. It was first-degree murder, premeditated. Ned... If the jury had brought me a guilty verdict, I would recommend psychiatric examination with a view to confinement at an institution for the criminally insane. But you didn't know he was... I mean, even I didn't know he was crazy. And do you know it now? Do you feel it now? Do you recognize that he needs cure more than punishment? Punishment. The law only penalizes the guilty, Ned. Isn't that what we all believe in? We don't penalize the sick. Uh, I, I, I have to go, Judge. I have something to do. Well, it's getting pretty late for running errands, Ned. Almost midnight. Yeah, but this, this is important, Judge. I have to see someone. I have to tell something very important. Hello? Is this Lucerne Dispatching? My name's Ned Murray. I'm a, I'm a friend of Tony Igo. No, no, M Murray, Murray. That's the last name, not the first. Look, it's very important that I reach Tony as soon as possible, only this is the only number he ever gave me to reach him. But he's got to have a home phone, right? So help me, it's important. It's a matter of... Look, who am I speaking to? Lady, please, I'm in a phone booth and it's pouring like hell and I'm getting soaked. No, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, look, I didn't mean to talk to you that way. Yes, I realize that, but if you could make this one exception. Well, how do you know he isn't home? For God's sakes, it's after midnight. Yes, yes, all right, all, all right, all right. He, he couldn't have done that tonight. He couldn't have, couldn't. Taxi! Taxi! Lou, is that you? Yeah, it's me. Disappointed? Where the heck have you been? I've been taking care of business. What business? Since when do you sell shoes in the middle of the night? I was taking care of some competition. That's what I was doing. Oh. What are you talking about? Oh, I pretend you don't know. But I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. You know something, Melanie? You make a rotten liar. I'm not lying. For God's sake, Lou, will, will you stop staring at me like that? I'm looking at you the way other men look at you. What other men? The one who comes around here every day when I'm out pounding the pavements, peddling those lousy shoes to those stores. Oh, Lou, nobody comes around. You're just in one of those crazy, jealous moods again. Well, I got news for you, Pumpkin. There's one boyfriend who's not coming around anymore. 
Are you still talking about that poor, dumb grocery boy? Lou, I no. told you there was... No, no, I'm talking about the old guy. One with the white hair. One who's been hanging around here all night, looking <gasps> up at our window, waiting to make sure that the coast is clear. <laughs> You're crazy. Crazy. I don't know any white-haired guys. Well, you'll never get to know this one, because he's got something wrong with him, baby. He's got a carving knife in his stomach. <gasps> Lou. Oh, my God, no. No, oh, you you didn't. Yes, I did. So you can forget about seeing your lover boy tonight, baby. You can just forget it. You'll have to be satisfied with just me. No, just tell me it isn't true. Tell me you didn't kill anyone. It wasn't the first time, Pumpkin. If you keep up the way you're going, it won't be the last. In fact, the next one might be you. <laughs> Oh, my God. Those, those police cars. They're, they're coming here. Lieutenant. Lieutenant. Lieutenant Gerhardt. Oh, hi, Ned. What are you doing here? What's going on? What's all the crowd about? Oh, wait a minute. You know the victim, don't you? Is that why you're here? You get a tip or something? Victim? Who? Tony Igo. Tony, somebody used a knife on him. Oh, God. Ironic, isn't it? Probably a dozen guys wanted Tony Igo knocked off, and how does he get it? From a jealous husband. Is he dead? Yeah, he's dead. And it was your ex-client who did it, that guy Rydell. He caught Tony hanging around the building watching the place. Rydell claims he was after his wife. You know about this, Ned? It's not true. It's not true, Lieutenant. He didn't even know the woman. Then what was he doing here? A favor. He was doing somebody a favor. What are you talking about? Look, where is Rydell now? Upstairs, answering questions. He won't get away. Not like the last time, Counselor. Yes, it won't be like the last time. Excuse me. Hey, 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 where do you think you're going? I want to see him. He's entitled to talk to a lawyer, isn't he? You must be nuts yourself. Half a dozen witnesses saw him. Can do I it. go up, Lieutenant? You mean you'll defend that screwball again? He's out of his mind. Don't you know that? Yes, I know. And that's what I'll try to prove. Now, will you please let me see my client? <laughs> So Ned Murray is about to try for still another verdict. This time a verdict which will carry a punishment more befitting to the crime. And something tells me that he'll be very successful. Not just as an attorney, but as a human being. I'll be back shortly. Some time ago, a man named Thomas De Quincey said, If once a man indulges himself in murder, very soon he comes to think very little of robbing. And from robbing, he comes next to drinking and Sabbath breaking. And from that, to incivility and procrastination. Let that be a lesson to all of you. This quotation and this story have come to you through the courtesy of our Radio Mystery Theater. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Joseph Julian, Bryna Rayburn, Barbara Caruso, Robert Dryden, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I take it you are referring to Miss Elaine Friend? Where is she? Back at her hotel. I had her sent back immediately. We did not want to speak to her. Just you. Okay. You have the floor, Mr. Colladanos. Uh, Colladinus, Monsieur Nash. It is an old name. In my country, a revered name. I'll do my best to remember. Well, continue. A question, Monsieur. Why are you in France? As we say at home, none of your business. <laughs> I like you, Monsieur Nash. You are refreshingly candid. You are working for FNB. You are a trusted, intelligent worker. Well thought of. Thanks for the information. When I get back, I'll put in for a raise. If you get back, Monsieur. If you get back. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part... By Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater 
for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.